it on? Absolutely. Okay. And thank you for the introduction, Dr. Scott. Wow, this is a huge audience. I think it's the biggest audience I've ever spoken to before. Um, so today I was invited to talk about my research in environmental health, but I wanted to start off by sharing a personal story with you guys. And it's a story that I don't talk about very often because it's hard to tell. But about a year and a half ago, my dad passed away due to cancer. And it was the hardest three years of my life after he was diagnosed because my dad had always been my best friend and mentor. And he was one of the healthiest, most energetic people I've ever known. What you can't see in these pictures and what didn't change until the moment that he took his last breath was his strength and his spirit to fight for what he believed in with 110%. In my research, people often ask me, what motivated you to keep going and to put in that 110%? And a lot of it came from the drive that I saw in my dad. In this case, he fought to stay with us, to be by my mom's side, to see my brother and I graduate from college, to get our first jobs, to start families of our own. So in my research, I was able to harness this drive, and I kept going. I kept at asking the questions that I was curious about. My research focuses on the toxicological effect of airborne pollutants on the lung health of asthmatic patients. And this is something that's very important to me, because in my family, we have a genetic predisposition to lung disorders be it asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or lung cancer. But this problem isn't specific to my family alone. Over 300 million people suffer from asthma worldwide. This results in about 1.6 million deaths every year, and about one death every 20 seconds. So it's something that I'm very interested in but I'm trying to get other people interested in, interested in it as well. In my research, I focused on four main pollutant groups. Particulate matter, size 10, volatile organic compounds, which are chemical pollutants, part, uh, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. So what happens when these pollutants come into contact with the lining of the bronchial tubes in our body is a cascading allergic physiological response. So our body goes through three main reactions. The first one is an excess production of mucus to cover up the irritation. The second is something called bronchoconstriction, which is where the muscle around this tube tightens in response to these pollutants. And the third one is a thickening of the lining. So as you can see in the picture, an asthmatic patient would be breathing out of a much narrower tube than a healthy person. And it's a very common misconception that asthma limits the amount of air a person can breathe in. In fact, it limits the amount of air a person can breathe out, which is a concept known as air trapping. So I measured this by using the peak expiratory flow rate, which is a measure of the exhalation rate, and it's a very um, indicative gauge of lung reactivity in people. So what this graph shows is on the x-axis, the particulate matter size 10 concentration in micrograms per meters, meters cubed, and on the y-axis, the percent peak expiratory flow rate degradation. So as you can see, for the male and female asthmatic subject shown by the red and purple lines, there's a very strong inverse correlation. And you don't see that for the blue and the green lines, which represent a control group or healthy people, because they are not reactive in the same way to some of these pollutants, or to the same extent, for that matter. So this graph is for particulate matter size 10, but I saw very similar results for the volatile organic compounds as well. So I collected over 4 million air quality readings over the span of a year and a half, and I tested about 103 human test subjects. But what I really wanted to do with this data is to put it into something like a quantifiable model that people can use to improve their environments and better predict what their lung health would be. 
According to Ms. Mitchum of the Oregon Health and Sciences University, no model currently exists that can predict lung health based on environmental pollutants. And this was confusing to me because through my research, I'd shown that these pollutants have such a huge impact on the lung health. So right now, models use three factors, age, gender, and height, which are pathophysiological factors to predict a person's lung health. And that's shown in equations one and two. So what I did is I used my data to build on this traditional model and incorporate the environmental pollutants of particulate matter size 10 and volatile organic compounds. And that's what you see in equations three and four. And what's cool about this model is that it's scalable and efficient in the sense that as I collect more data for different pollutants, for larger sample sizes, different geographical locations, I can improve this model so that environmental specialists and medical professionals are getting the best reading for our patients. So I also created a software program that people could use in order to better understand what's in their air and how they can improve it. And this is just a screenshot of an output for a sample subject. So what you see in the yellow bar is a person's actual peak expiratory flow rate. So if you go into a doctor's office and they take your peak expiratory flow rate, that's the value that the doctor sees. The light blue bar shows what my model predicts your lung health should be at based on your age, gender, height, as well as the environmental pollutants. And then the dark blue bar represents what traditional models predict your lung health should be at based on only the pathophysiological pollutants or the pathophysiological factors, rather. So when a doctor sees this difference between what you're at right now and what you should be at, they treat this difference with inhalers, steroids, and other medications. What my research suggests is that we should break this difference up into the environmental factors and the pathophysiological factors. This way, we're not over-prescribing inhalers, steroids, and medication for an environmentally rooted problem. And instead, we're targeting the environment and focusing on environmental remediation. So many people ask me, what can I do in my own home or in my workplace or in my school to improve the indoor air quality? A few things include limiting the use of incense, candles, anything that emits a scent or a smell. If you're remodeling, rip out the carpet and put in hardwood flooring because carpeting traps these pollutants and they off-gas over the years. Revamping the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in our buildings to include more than just a basic net filter. As well as transitioning to products on the marketplace that are low or no VOC, which are volatile organic compounds or those chemical pollutants. And my brother and I, we both were very curious as to why these allergies kept persisting in our family. So what I did when I found this out was I created a cost-benefit analysis for my parents. And I said, I know this poses an upfront cost to us, but the long-term benefits of our health outweigh those upfront costs. So the third phase of my research involved engineering a biofilter. And what a biofilter is, is a filter based on plant materials. So as these volatile organic compounds come into contact with the plant material, they're metab metabolically broken down into innocuous byproducts. And my goal for this phase of the project was to come up with a way to cost effectively and sustainably remove these pollutants from our indoor airstreams. So I conducted all of this research on a very small scale. I simulated the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system at a small level in the basement of my home, and I deployed the biofilter in this simulation to see how effective it was in removing these pollutants. What I found was that it was 40% efficient, meaning that it removed about 40% of the volatile organic compounds from the, from the airstream, and specifically I focused on four main pollutants that are one, most harmful to human health, and two most abundant in the products that we use. And these are xylene, toluene, styrene, and ethyl benzene. And I show that those levels decreased as well. Now, even though this is a very preliminary research project, 
It shows that there is potential in this field to be able to remove these pollutants from our indoor airstreams in a cost-effective way. And that was very exciting to me. So I'm excited to continue working on this and move forward in this research. So this research has, has in implications across many different disciplines, including medical treatment, environmental remediation, and national regulatory policy. So when I was in eighth grade, I wrote a letter to President Obama, as well as the EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson. And this is just a small excerpt of my letter. And I thought that these letters would end up in a trash can somewhere, or a recycling bin. But I was wrong. So about two years ago, I entered in the Google Global Science Fair, and I was one of the age category winners for the 15-16 age group. And as a result, I was able to fly to Washington, D.C. and meet with President Obama in the Oval Office, as well as former EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson and NIH directors. And what these meetings provided for me was a platform for which I could share my research at a national level and really understand how these environmental pollutants are regulated at a national level. So here's the picture with President Obama in the Oval Office. Um, so another thing that was really exciting was that I was able to compete in science fairs besides the Google Science Fair. So one of them was the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, as well as the Intel Science Talent Surge. As, as a result of doing well at these competitions, I was an intern at the Intel Labs in Hillsborough, Oregon, under Richard Beckwith and Tony in the Interactions and Experiences group. I was also invited to Malala Day at the UN in New York, as well as to the Tech Needs Girls event in Brussels, Belgium. And at this event, I was able to talk about a camp that I had created for young girls called FACT Camp, which stands for Females Advancing Computing and Technology. And my goal for this camp was to empower young girls to be interested in STEM fields and then stick with it. My personal goal is to be a leader in the movement towards a 50-50 ratio of girls to boys in these STEM fields because we need to harness the potential of the other half of the population in these disciplines that are key to innovation in society. So as a result of my life experiences, I've realized that I'm passionate about two things in my, in my life. One of them is my research, and the second one is education reform specifically related to getting more girls interested in STEM. But if there are two things that I want to leave you with, and what I want you to walk out of my, of my presentation with today, they are one, that each one of us can take action in our own homes, our own schools, in our workplaces, to improve the indoor air quality, not only for us, but for our future, gener future generations as well. We spend over 90% of our lives indoors. And believe it or not, indoor air quality is about two to five times inferior than outdoor air. And I don't mean for this talk to scare you, but I do want it to encourage people to take action. The second thing I want to leave you with is that even though my dad isn't physically present here today, his drive, his strength, and his spirit to fight for what he believes in and put in 110% effort will always stay with me. And I hope that you can take away that from this talk and apply it to all of your endeavors as well. Thank you.